Welcome back to another lecture. This is 7.4, The Progressives. We have two themes today, politics and power, and the second one is geography and the environment. We will also have two learning objectives today. The first one is compare the goals and effects of the progressive reform movement. So there's going to be a lot of information in this slideshow. Uh, the College Board just jam-packed this historical topic with a lot of information. So we're going to do our best to get through it. The first key concept is some progressive era journalists attacked what they saw as political corruption, social injustice, and economic inequality. So these are who we call the muckrakers. They are looking for injustices in society and trying to shine a light on them so that there can be some reform um, in society. Uh, they targeted to different areas, so corruption uh, in politics and local government. We have Lincoln Steffens, who wrote Tweed, Day, Tweed Days in St. Louis. You might also recognize Lincoln Steffens' name because he wrote the book Progress and Poverty, talking about how this urbanization and uh, capitalist economic, economic growth is also being coupled with a high degree of income inequality. For social injustice and economic inequality, we have uh, The Jungle that was written by Upton Sinclair that went into the meatpacking industry and some of the really gross practices that they were um, doing inside of the meatpacking factories. And How the Other Half Lives was a also a book by Jacob Rees. He included some photographs, like the one that you see here, about what it was like for people living in the cities. As you can see it's dirty, it's cramped, um, it's uncomfortable. And the muckrakers, they were criticized by Teddy Roosevelt, despite Teddy Roosevelt being considered a progressive president. But they were successful in bringing about the reforms. And in fact, Teddy Roosevelt knew some of these muckrakers, um, like Jacob Rees. Whenever Rees had published How the Other Half Lives and Teddy Roosevelt was working in New York politics, he actually went around the city and um, saw what Rees had written about in his book. So while reformers, often from the middle and upper class and including many women, worked to affect social changes in cities and among immigrant populations. So here we're going to talk about the characteristics of progressives. And so the main three would be upper and middle class and women. So the upper and middle class, they are now starting to get involved into some of the things that they see as unjust in the world because now they have more disposable income and time. This is a new development as a result of the economic expansion from the Gilded Age. There was not a large middle class before that economic expansion. At the same time, you have women like Jane Addams, who we talked about in the previous period, in the settlement house movement that are trying to provide social services to new immigrants coming into the cities. Her settlement house was called Whole House. It's in the south side of Chicago. You can see the what it looked like. There was a postcard there. If you travel to Chicago, you can still see the building standing today. Women were also active in other movements, so suffrage with a... Um, Women's Suffrage Association with Carrie Chapman Catt and the um, offshoot of that, the National Women's Party with Alice Paul taking a more aggressive approach to fighting for suffrage. And there's also the temperance movement, which was trying to get a nationwide prohibition of alcohol. All right, so the progressives were divided over many issues. Some progressives supported Southern segregation, while others ignored its presence. So there were progressives that were in favor of segregation. President Wilson, again, is considered to be a very progressive president for his time. However, he was born in the South, and he still had some of those um, Southern stereotypes or Southern ways of thinking. And uh, while he was president in the White House, he screamed, screened one of the first full-length uh, feature films that was called The Birth of a Nation, which was a movie, as you can see from the movie poster, that was glorifying the Ku Klux Klan as uh, a, a good force in the United States. There's still inaction on segregation. You see that Plessy versus Ferguson uh, court case in 1896 made separate facilities for blacks and whites constitutional. A separate but equal doctrine is still in effect. Segregation is found in education and housing in the North and also in the South. So Ida Tarbell is still also working on the issue of lynching. And um, 
I'm going to give you a warning here. There is one picture that's coming up that is quite graphic. That's why it's blacked out. But this is what the, the lynchings looked like. People would gather around and they would um, beat the people that they were lynching. And then at the end, they would post with the body. So this is all still going on at the same time that the progressive era is uh, going on and all these other reforms are being put in place. African Americans were largely left to fend for themselves and the, some of the people who we talked about in the last historical period like W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington were still active in that fight for equality. Now there's still divisions within um, their movement as well. Du Bois uh, is responsible for co-founding the Niagara Movement and the NAACP. On the left picture, you can see um, the Niagara Movement. They commemorated the creation of this movement with a picture next to Niagara Falls. And the NAACP will continue to be active through the 20th century to the present day. Booker T. Washington had a different approach to Du Bois because he was asking for uh, a more gradual path towards equality. He wanted to make sure that African Americans had economic opportunities first, and then they could be seen as equals in the eyes of white Americans. He had a famous speech in 1896 called the Atlanta Compromise Speech, in which he's asking both blacks and whites to cast down their buckets where they are, basically saying that use the resources and the opportunities that you have now in order to better yourself, and then you can figure out uh, the path towards equality. He uh, was the founder of the Tuskegee Institute, which provided a technical education, so in keeping with his philosophy that African Americans needed to have opportunities at getting higher paying jobs so that they could eventually become, uh, enjoy equality uh, in American society. At the same time, we also have one more uh, group that's created, the National Urban League, uh, by George Edmund Haynes, and you see the logo up there on the top right, they are still active today. And they will also have a similar ideology to Washington, basically looking for new economic opportunities that will create a pathway for equality. All right, we have some political reform. Some progressives advocated expanding popular participation in government, while others called for greater reliance on professional and technical experts to make government more efficient. So those that wanted to expand participation wanted to make sure that voters had access to making more decisions. So this is where the initiative referendum and the recall come into play. An initiative is when voters are able to vote on an issue so that they can force their legislature to take up the issue and possibly write legislation. A referendum is when a legislature puts the decision on a certain policy up to the voters. And then finally, a recall is whenever a elected official has the ability or is uh, potentially uh, going to be voted out of office by the voters who voted them in. Uh, the picture in the top, you see that there are a couple of men who have collected petitions to recall one of their local politicians. And so that's exactly how it works. Before the, the vote can take place, there needs to be a certain amount of people that agree to the recall uh, or voters who are in that district. And they sign petitions so that the person can be recalled. More political reforms here. We have the secret ballot, so uh, the actual use of these voting booths that you see in the, on the uh, right side where people's votes are completely secret. This is working to diminish the influence of political party machines. So political party machines wanted to make sure that the people who would go into the voting booths would vote down the party line so that way they could continue to offer patronage jobs. Now, as political machines are losing the ability to reward their um, constituents or their patrons with jobs, um, the people can feel more confidence in voting against the political machine. And then the secret ballot is just aiding in that because they know that there's not going to be any retribution against them if they don't vote in favor of the machine. Um, a lot of these reforms are being pushed for and experimented with by state politicians. One of these uh, state politicians who is seen as the face of the progressive movement is Robert La Follette from Wisconsin. He was a representative, a senator, and also a governor for the state of Wisconsin. And um, 
tried running in national politics, I think, for president. Uh, but he is the face of this state progressive movement and trying to expand suffrage for Americans. Uh, other reforms, we have the direct election of senators and direct primaries, again, working to eliminate the influence of political machines and the wealthy. So if senators who used to be voted in by the state legislatures now have to account to the voters, then the machines or the wealthy influences are less likely to put people in power um, that are not going to listen to the public will. All right, and so then for the reliance on experts in government, we see that there are two new ways of running city governments. So the first one is the city commissioner system, that is in which you have one commissioner running every uh, each department in the city. So there would be a police commissioner, a fire commissioner, a sanitation commissioner. A lot of the times, because the commissioners had to deal with public ut uh, with utilities, the commissioner system would be enacted simultaneously with a public ownership of utilities. That means that the electric companies, the water companies would come under the ownership and management of the city. The other type of system is called the city manager system. So the city council could hire an expert city manager to over city business. And as you see in the diagram on the right side, the, the mayor in this case kind of becomes a ceremonial role. They don't really have that much power because the city manager is the one that's going to take care of most of the city business. This is common, uh, or this is, it's part of a larger trend because in business, there are consultants that are being used like Frederick Taylor, who uh, is starting to experiment with scientific management. So basically trying to make every part of a business as efficient as possible. This is kind of in that same trend where the city manager could make the city more efficient because they are trained in the uh, different specific parts about city government or um, city management. All right, also immigration is another thing that progressives uh, were split on. So there are some progressives who are going to uh, believe in racial theories like social Darwinism and believe that there is a, a hierarchy of races, and so therefore some races should not be let into the United States, while others are going to um, say that that's not the case, and so therefore immigration should be allowed without many restrictions. During the 1920s, there uh, is a growth in the fear of communism, socialism, anarchists coming from abroad. Uh, part of this is heightened with the uh, murder cases of Sacco and Vanzetti, who were Italian immigrants, who were also anarchists and had committed a murder, were alleged to commit a murder. Um, they were executed without really having uh, known that for sure whether they were the ones that committed the murder. And so this hysteria against immigration led to a couple pieces of legislation that severely restricted immigration. So the first one is the 1917 Immigration Act. It implements the literacy test. It says that anyone coming into the United States who is over the age of 16 has to have the ability to read, whether it be in their home language or in English. Additionally, it creates a barred zone, which excludes most of Asia from being able to immigrates to the United States. You see the map on the top right. It includes all of South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, and it leaves out uh, parts of Japan. The next one is the 1921 Emergency Quota Act and the 1924 National Origins Act. So these build on each other. They severely restrict immigration outside the Western Hemisphere. So any um, country that's sending immigrants to the United States can now only send 3% and then later 2% of the immigrants that they had sent going back to 1890. So the main purpose of this is trying to limit the amount of immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe because in 1890, there were very few immigrants that were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. And so therefore, not only will they cut out 98% of those uh, that number, but that number, that original number is going to be a lot smaller because in that time period, there weren't a lot of Southern and Eastern Europeans coming to the U.S. 
All right, so on the national level, progressives sought federal legislation that they believed would effectively regulate the economy, expand democracy, and generate moral reform. So in order to regulate the economy, uh, we pass more legislation to bust trust. So the Clayton Antitrust Act strengthens the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The Elkins Act gives more power to the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate the price of railroads. Again, you see the political cartoon uh, of the railroad executives asking Uncle Sam to raise the rates. The Supreme Court case, Mueller versus Oregon, rules in favor of setting a maximum work number of working hours, but this is at the expense of uh, women's equality. The reasoning that the court ruled in favor of the workers in this case is because there were women who were at the center of the case and the Supreme Court said that given that they were women they would not be as strong to work as many hours and so therefore the states could make laws that could restrict a number of maximum working hours. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who was president in the first decade of the, of the 20th century, um, his approach was called the square deal. He was trying to mediate between labor and management. Um, he wanted to make sure that, that both sides got the, the fairest uh, deal that was possible. And he was also going to go after bad trusts. These are companies that were doing things that were going to stifle competition and keep uh, and unfairly raise prices on consumers. And then finally, we see the Child Labor Act, which ends child labor by setting a limit of 14 years old, so basically making it illegal for companies to transport things that had been manufactured by anyone under the age of 14. All right, so we have some Constitutional amendments that come out of this historical period. Progressive amendments to the Constitution dealt with issues such as prohibition and women's suffrage. So let's start from the very beginning. 16th Amendment creates an income tax or it makes the income tax constitutional. The 17th Amendment uh, allows for the direct election of senators. We talked about how that diminishes the power of wealthy influences and political machines. The 18th Amendment is a success for the temperance movement because it prohibits the manufacture, sale, or transport of alcohol, and it's going to be enforced through the Volstead Act. The 19th Amendment gives the right to vote to women, so suffrage cannot be denied on the basis of sex. And then finally, the 21st Amendment <laughs> repeals prohibition because prohibition had led to a rise in criminal activity because now drinking alcohol was illegal or transporting it was illegal. Um, Congress saw it as a failed experiment, and so therefore they repealed it. That's why we wrote there, big whoops. All right, and now here's the second learning objective. Uh, it says compare attitudes towards the use of natural resources from 1890 to 1945. So it's a short key concept here for this learning objective. Preservationists and conservationists both supported the establishment of national parks while advocating different government responses to the overuse of natural resources. So there's the answer to the learning objective. That there's two points of view. There's preservationists and conservationists. Preservationists want to protect nature from being used while conservationists still care about nature, but they want to have a proper use of it without uh, destroying it for the future. So the faces of this debate would be John Muir and Gifford Pinchot. On the left side, you see John Muir standing with Teddy Roosevelt uh, in Yosemite Valley, and then on the right side, you see Gifford Pinchot. Both are friends and acquaintances of Teddy Roosevelt. Under Roosevelt's administration, Gifford Pinchot was put in charge of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, but during this era, the conservationists end up kind of getting their way more so than the preservationists. Uh, the case of Hetch Hetchy in California is a great example of this. Uh, the picture of it is on the bottom right there. You see it looks very similar to what Yosemite Valley uh, looks like, and that's because they're just about 20 to 30 miles away from each other. But while Yosemite Valley was preserved for people to visit and made into a national park, Hetch Hetchy was dammed up and used as a water reservoir that would be used for the drinking water of the San Francisco Bay Area. 
So uh, the reason why that picture is black and white is because now if you were to go there today, all of that would be filled with water. All right, and so for legislation that came out of this period, we have the Forest Reserve Act. So it was utilized by Teddy Roosevelt to set aside 150 million acres of land. For the conservationist movement, we have the New Lands Reclamation Act. So the public land is being sold, but then the money from those sales is being used to fund irrigation projects. And then President Taft, also seen as a progressive president, um, is setting aside federal oil land to lease out to companies to uh, extract oil from it, and then also establishing the Bureau of Mines. So to try and regulate the amount of uh, things that are mined in the United States or on federal land. All right, so that was it. I know that was a long one, but here's our recap. We started with muckrakers. They were exposing the injustices in politics, society, and the economy. The progressives were mostly in the upper and middle class, and most of the time were women. We have progressive de debates on segregation, immigration, and city government. Uh, progressive use to the federal governments to put in place their reforms. And then finally, preservationists and conservationists disagree. Uh, the conservationists are winning out for the most part. All right, so thank you for watching this lecture. Please come back and watch the next one where we will begin talking about World War I. Thank you and see you then.